So now if I run the code... Hi everyone, Greg here. How many bits are there in a byte? You might think the answer is obvious, but I was surprised to find out that the byte was only formally standardized to be 8 bits as late as 1993. By that time, the world had pretty much already agreed that a byte was 8 bits, but if you had bought a computer in the 1960s or 70s, then a byte could be 5, 6 or 7 bits, depending on what the manufacturer decided. There even existed 12 and 18 bit systems. Now how they came up with those numbers, I don't know. And I couldn't find out for sure whether 12 and 18 bits were the smallest addressable parts of the system. This PDP-7, which first shipped in 1965, is an 18-bit system and is the computer used by Ken Thompson to create the first version of Unix. But how can computers even store text, since they can only really store zeros and ones? You need a character set, that is to say a list where you match the numbers with the characters. Throughout history there have been many of those, and the problem is actually older than computers themselves. It goes back to the telegraph. In the 1870s, a 5-bit character set was invented by Emile Bordeaux, known as the Bordeaux Code for use in telegraphy. This code was modified in 1901 into the Murray Code for use with Taylor printers. Taylor printers looked roughly like typewriters, but they could send and receive messages over a wire. Taylor printers were also called Teletype Writers, or TTY. If you ever wondered why we use the term TTY in Unix and Linux systems, that's why. The Murray code became obsolete with the introduction of ASCII in 1963. Yes, ASCII was originally designed for use with teletype writers. The hint is in the name, American Standard Code of Information Interchange. It was developed by the ASA, American Standard Association, which we today know better as the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. If you look carefully at the ASCII table, some characters will make a lot more sense now. For instance, the carriage return. On a typewriter, a carriage moves the paper sideways as the characters are being typed. This would have to be returned to its initial position before you could type the next line. The line feed literally means feed enough paper through the teletype to start typing the next line. Today we would barely recognize the computers from the 1960s as computers. They did not have a screen and they had to output data with a printer or a panel of LEDs. The IBM 1400 series used a 6-bit BCD encoding system, binary coded decimal. I suggest you watch Curious Mark's video to see such a computer in action. The link will be in the description. It's very interesting. If you're a real nerd, that is. In the early 1960s, IBM developed the 8-bit EPSIDIC character set, which was an extension of BCD. The system was shipped with the IBM 360. EPSIDIC's use was short-lived, as even early on IBM agreed that everyone should settle for ASCII. In 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson mandated that all computers sold to the US federal government must use ASCII. The late 1960s and early 1970s saw the increasing use of terminals and the invention of Unix and the C programming language. Those terminals were basically just screen and keyboards connected to a large mainframe computer. Back then life was simple. One byte was the same thing as one character, which was the same thing as one code point. In fact, people hadn't even thought of code points, as the concept was unnecessary. More about them later. As a side point, it might be worth talking about glyphs. A glyph is a visual representation of a character. So the lowercase a can have many different glyphs. Those two glyphs represent the same character. A font is essentially a collection of glyphs and come in two flavors, serif and sans serif. A serif is a decoration you find around the glyph. And sans comes from the French sans, meaning without. So with serifs and without serifs. In 1981, the IBM PC came onto the market. This could support several operating systems, but was used overwhelmingly with Microsoft DOS 1.0. Around the same time, a whole slew of different systems came onto the market, like the ZX Spectrum, the Commodore 64, the VIC-20, etc. These are collectively known as 8-bit computers. 
and yes, now we got to 8 bits as the standard size. The computer made by the Commodore business machine used the 8-bit Petsky character set, but the IBM PC used ASCII. It's around this point in history that we also encountered the first major problem with text that plagues us to this day. In a plain text document, in order to go to a new line, the Microsoft operating systems use a carriage return followed by a line feed, whereas the Unix slash Linux operating system use just a new line. In an Apple operating system, a single carriage return was used until Mac OS X, and then Apple switched to using a line feed just like in Unix. It's a mess. In the standard C runtime library, you have a function called fopen which accepts two variables, the path of the file you want to open and flags. The flags can be R, W or A, depending on whether you want to read, write or append to the file. The library will automatically translate the end of line characters to suit your operating system. Sometimes, however, you want to get the exact sequence of bytes from the file, so you can add the B flag, B for binary, which will not translate the end of line characters. So what do you do when you have an 8-bit computer, but ASCII is just 7 bits? The answer is extended ASCII. Now if it had been extended in such a way that everyone was using the same extension, that would have been fine. But you know the story is never that simple. So extended ASCII, a set of different extensions for ASCII. The most used one is probably Windows 1252, which focuses on European languages. These have since been standardized jointly by the ISO, International Organization of Standardization, and the IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission. They are known as the ISO IEC 8859-X series. There are 15 of those to accommodate different languages all around the world, and they are numbered from 1 to 16. Number 12 was never released, and was never finished, because Unicode made it obsolete. In 1989, the ISO started working on the UCS, Universal Character Set, what we know today as Unicode. Unicode allows for 1.1 million possible code points. So now we have to talk about code points. A code point is roughly speaking a number which matches a character, just like a character set. But it's not as simple as that. So let's take a simple case first. The code point for the smiling emoji is 1F60A in hexadecimal. By convention, Unicode code points are written like this. They're preceded by a U and a plus. And then the code point itself is written in hexadecimal. There's no actual addition taking place here. That's just how it's written. So now another example. An E with a diacritic. A diacritic is a collective name for all the extra things you can add to a character. So those two dots are called an umlaut. So is the E umlaut a character in its own right, or is it merely the character E with something added? Now you might say that's just a philosophical question, but there are actually two ways of representing this in Unicode. So I could just print a string of characters which contains this code point, U plus EB, or I could print a string of characters which contains those two code points one after the other, U plus 65, and U plus 308. One representing the E and the following one representing the umlaut. So a Unicode code point doesn't necessarily match a character. It can match a concept which only makes sense in combination with other code points. There are even code points to change emojis to black and white or other code points to change the skin tone of emojis. With Unicode there are many assumptions you can no longer make. You can no longer assume a character is a byte, so if you do a string lin, it will return the number of bytes, but not the number of characters. Code points may not necessarily represent full characters, and letters may have more than one code point. In Arabic, letters have different shapes depending on where they appear in the text, and thus every letter will have multiple code points. Now once your code points are more than 8 bits, you need an encoding. That is to say, you need some way of deciding how you're going to represent the code points using bytes. An early encoding scheme was UCS2. This encoding requires you to use two bytes for every single code point, even when only one is enough. Those 16-bit data types are known as white characters, and you've surely seen them, 
if you have ever used the Win32 API. With 16 bits, you can encode a maximum of 65,535 code points. When it became clear that this wasn't going to be enough, USC2 was replaced with UTF-16. I couldn't find a lot of reference for this, but it seems that the switch happened with the release of Windows 2000. UTF-16 is a variable length encoding, which allows you to use 2 or 4 bytes to encode a code point. In the Win32 API, you often find multiple versions of a syscall, one ending in A and the other ending in W. A stands for ANSI, as in ANSI ASCII, and the W stands for white character, and those take a UTF-16 string. I'm not going to say too much about UTF-16. Basically, I recommend you don't use it unless you really have to with a legacy system. I want to get to UTF-8. UTF-8 is a ray of sunshine and sanity in this whole encoding mess. Any system you're working with today, unless it's a legacy system and you don't have any choice, you should use UTF-8. It gets rid of so many problems when it comes to text. Here's how UTF-8 works. The first 127 code points of Unicode are the same as ASCII. If you encode one of those, you make the most significant bit of the byte zero and you place the code point in the remaining seven bits. In this situation, UTF-8 is identical to ASCII and thus UTF-8 is forward and backward compatible with ASCII. That is a big part of its appeal. What if you encode a code point beyond that? You place once in the most significant part of the first byte, as many as you're using bytes. So here I'm using two bytes, two ones at the start. The ones are followed by a zero. The remaining five bits are used for the code point. The second byte starts with a one and a zero, and the remaining six bits are used for the code point. You can use up to four bytes with UTF-8, which is sufficient to encode the 1.1 million potential code points. Notice that single byte encodings always start with a zero. All bytes of a multi-byte encoding always start with a one. The second bit of the additional bytes is always zero. This way you can always tell where a code point starts and ends, even when you start scanning somewhere in the middle of a text. So now we're getting to the code. Okay, so here's the code I wanted to show you. So you have the prototype here, text string UTF-8. What that does is it takes a code point and it puts it into a string in the manner that you've seen me explain just a second ago. So here's the code of the function. I'm going to have the, um, the link in the GitLab. But here is what I wanted to show you. So what I do is I make the code point equal to this number. You'll see in a second why I chose this number. And I will go through a thousand iterations of this. I use my function in order to... So here I have a string, UTF-8. I put this code point into the string. Ignore what's in comments for now. I'll show you that later. And then I do a print F. I print the contents of that string, which now has the code point encoded in it. I increment the code point, increment I. Uh, that's just a bit for layout. So now if I run the code, okay, and there now you see all the emojis. So I said earlier in the video, there is a code point you can use to change how the emojis are being displayed. You can have them displayed in black and white. So this is the code point that does that, which needs to come immediately after the emoji. And it needs to come after every single emoji you want displayed in black and white. So if we run this again, you see they're now all in black and white. Okay, and a modern Linux terminal will actually display emoji uh, only if you have one of those GUI emulated uh, terminals. It doesn't work in the more uh, classical TTY. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to show you. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something. And if you don't mind, give me a, a like and a subscribe. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching.